Um, so I'm going to start today with Tim Abre. So I'll ask the other uh, presenters to turn off your mic and your webcam. And I'm going to introduce Tim. And Tim came to my attention uh, last June when I saw he was being quoted in the media after the Ontario election, like quite a lot about democracy and the electoral system and just all those kind of related issues. And so I got in touch with him, was thrilled to make his acquaintance. So Tim is a PhD candidate in politics at Queen's University. He is a former radio journalist and award-winning communications consultant whose interest in political systems is fed by 25 years of experience in political and public policy communication, including working as a press secretary to an Ontario cabinet minister. Tim's practical experience informs his doctoral research, leading him to closely examine the effect of communication tactics on individuals and democratic institutions. Tim lives in Ottawa, and he wrote extensively on the dynamics of the Freedom Convoy and the political response to it, and he had op-eds published in the Ottawa Citizen. He's also frequently quoted in the media on various political topics. Tim is going to talk to us about the impact that the Freedom Convoy had, um, polarization in Canada, the implications for Canadian democracy. He's going to talk about some of the challenges we face and solutions. So thank you very much for joining us. Hey, thank you very much, Anita. I appreciate the invitation. I think uh, this topic, in my view, is always timely. Um, but I think that there's been an awful lot happening uh, globally, locally, um, that should increase the interest uh, in, in fair representation generally. Uh, and so I think that the more we can talk about this subject in forums like this, um, the more likely it is that we're going to bring people to a higher level of understanding of the need for change uh, and help people understand the benefits of that kind of change. So I'm going to spend my time, I'm going to be as quick as I can, because I, I think what we really want to do is get through the material, obviously, and hear what people have to say. But I'm going to use my time to talk a bit about, to focus on the convoy a bit, but to talk about it as a manifestation of our politics generally right now. Um, to those of us who study political behavior and who have been watching uh, the evolution of electoral politics, particularly in Canada over the last uh, 25, 30 years, um, the convoy is not so much a surprise. Uh, there are things about it that were surprising. But I think that what surprised those of us who study this stuff is how much it caught the popular attention uh, and how much general interest there was in what the convoyers were attempting to do. And there was an awful lot of debate about what they were trying to do. And so the convoy very clearly tapped into a generalized anxiety that is out there. It became kind of an empty vessel for people to park their various uh, concerns, their various worries, their various personal grievances, um, their agitations about the way the politics is done, it became a grab bag for a lot of different conversations that have been happening either on a very local level or a very personal level and brought them bubbling to the surface uh, on a national level and fully in view on the national stage. So the question that I think we need to ask ourselves is where does that come from? Uh, a lot of people wrote this off as a spontaneous occurrence, you know, just good timing, bad timing, a mix of things going on. But I think it's really important for us to ask ourselves if there's that much anxiety that we can get thousands of people occupying the nation's capital, occupying neighborhoods, driving the, the national conversation for three weeks at a time, it's really important for us to have a look at what it is that, that made this the moment. And I think that it's important to look at that anxiety and the kinds of things uh, that were in it, but it's more important to look at what the institutional response was to that bubbling up. We had people hitching you know, their hopes about all of their diverse issues to this fairly dangerous core that was at the center of this. Dangerous, I say, because it was chaotic. Uh, the demands were chaotic. Uh, in most cases, the demands were quite nonsensical. But still, somehow, that energy allowed people to attach all of those hopes and dreams to that process and show up in the Capitol uh, and make their voices heard whatever, uh, on whatever topic it was they wished to, to, choose, to choose to speak on. And I think that we really need to look carefully at the role of leadership 
in all of this. I live in the downtown of Ottawa. I live in what was uh, what came to be known as the red zone of the city. It was the part of the city where um, control and access uh, access to it became controlled uh, toward the end of the occupation. It was very poorly policed. There was a lot of concern uh, about what might happen in this zone. So I was at the epicenter of it. And the thing that was really, really apparent to those of us particularly living in that area was the complete void of leadership voices through all of this. It took our mayor a good week and a half to say anything of significance uh, to the people living here. But it wasn't just that. It was the way in which the leadership manifested across uh, the national leadership, because the protesters were focused at the federal government. And yet the conversation that was happening seemed to be more, it was ratcheted up, but it was more of the same partisan nitpicking and mud throwing. And I think that that was extraordinarily disappointing to a lot of people, that they didn't rise to the occasion and drive that conversation from a leadership level. And I think we have to look at why that is. And I think anyone who's in this forum understands that there is, there is a lot hardwired into our system that promotes this kind of division, promotes this kind of partisan behavior. Um, our system as it stands at the moment drives segmenting of audiences so that political parties can carve out tranches of vote to help build support for themselves um, to attract all of the power that's available. There is no strong incentive to cooperate. There is no strong incentive to, uh, to drive consensus across issues. There is powerful incentive to drive wedges, to highlight um, critical mobilizing issues. There is a large amount of, um, uh, there's a huge amount of incentive to simply drive issues that work rather than working on the sticky problems that are at the center of our politics. I mean, we wouldn't need politics if we all agreed on everything all of the time, right? Our political systems are there to help us navigate through the sticky issues, help us navigate uh, policy problems, and come to some solutions that hopefully we can all live with. But unfortunately, our electoral system is not driven towards consensus. It's driven towards uh, partisan wedging. It drives parties to compete by casting aspersions on their opponents. And so I think that, that what we really need to do, what really needs to happen uh, is simple conceptually, but it's profoundly complex because of the number of systems, institutions, and the, the number of people involved in just, frankly, human behavior. Um, what needs to happen is the dynamic needs to be pushed back towards one of meaningful disagreement, as opposed to simply casting stones at one another. There needs to be room for meaningful disagreement that's aimed at breaking up these policy log jams we have with an acceptable consensus solution. And I think that that's an important thing that we should be talking about, that rather than ratcheting up the temperature on these, these issues, driving people uh, into states where they look for more extreme solutions to things, we should be creating a space where we can have much stronger nuanced discussions around this. And I think that that's obviously where proportional representation comes in to this equation, right? That if our system makes it very difficult for any one party to garner all of the power with a fraction of the vote, if it forces them into a position where they have to, work with the people across the aisle on a day-to-day -day basis in order to get the work of government done. It's going to drive the conversation into a place where there is more respect. It becomes, we disincentivize um, casting aspersions on your opponents because eventually you're gonna to have to work with those people. You're going to have to explain to the broader electorate why it is that they were bad yesterday, but good today. And I think that the more that we can shape institutions um, in order to help shape the kind of conversation we want to have, the better off we're going to be. And I think the convoy was a perfect illustration of what wedge politics does. It creates these very stark contrasts between political actors and simply ratchets up emotion. It ratchets up uh, people's feelings of discontent, but it doesn't provide clear trustworthy avenues for reaching consensus around the issues that are at the heart of that animus, at the heart of the disagreement. And so I think that it's, it's time, uh, occasions like the, the convoy, create an opportunity to educate people about the possibilities of our system, 
uh, and about the problems that are inherent in the way in which we do run the system. And so that's essentially it, that we need to rethink our institutions so that they can help reshape behavior, provide venue for more constructive political behavior um, by limiting those paths to complete unobstructed agenda control, which of, of course is the big prize of our system, right? If you can win just enough seats, you get all of the power. And that has become the day-to-day -day obsession for tactical political strategists, just simply winning. What we really need is to be focusing on policy that satisfies the needs that are at the heart of those anxieties and the heart of those disagreements. And so if we have a system in place that forces the need for collaboration and coalition building around those meaningful issues, marginal positions will become marginalized within the system. And I think it's, it's high time that we had a serious national discussion about that. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll get into more in the Q&A and the discussion afterwards. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, I can't say I disagreed with anything on there. One thing that Tim brought up that I just wanted to highlight is this whole thing about meaningful disagreement. And to me, that's at the core. This whole thing of polarization is very new for me. And when I looked at polarization, what I found from the academic literature is that there's issue polarization, which we actually should have. That's called having a difference of opinion that motivates people to participate versus affective polarization, which is I hate you because you're with them. And, and that's what's sort of scary in our current system. So, so thanks so much, Tim, for putting that in language. It's really easy to understand. Okay, I'm going to introduce Will Horn now. Uh, come on on, Will. There you are, okay. Uh, so Will Horn is, uh, has a PhD in political science from Princeton University and is a postdoctoral research fellow with the Executive Approval Project based at Georgia State University. His research focuses on parties, elections, polarization, representation, and inequality. Uh, Will's work has been published in the American Political Science Review, the uh, British Journal of Political Science and Comparative Political Studies. He has an ongoing project and a book with three other authors that expands on the research of affective polarization and partisan hostility, comparing different countries. Their work has been featured on 538 Foreign Policy and the Washington Post. And the reason Will came to my attention, being in the United States, um, I'm sure we're, many of us are following sort of what goes on in the United States, is that they wrote a paper that I read called The Way We Were, How Histories of Co-Governance Alleviate Partisan Hostility. So Will is going to talk about his research on partisan hostility and polarization. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Anita, and thanks for the uh, great introduction. And awesome to see so many more over 350 people on this call now, which is pretty amazing for this topic. So that's that's great. Also, thanks to Tim for a great uh, sort of first talk. It actually really leads in great to this. He sort of gives the political theory argument for why we should be having this conversation. And now I'll come in with an empirical study of, of just that. So I had no idea what Tim was going to talk about, but that's actually a great lead in. So that was perfect. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, I made some slides for this. Uh, so can anyone just confirm that you can see these uh, these slides I'm sharing? Yes. Cool. Yeah, I see some yeses in the chat. Awesome. Yeah. So, so like Anita said, um, you know, we, me and two other authors recently put out a book on American effective polarization in comparative perspective, which means we're looking at this type of polarization that Anita was just talking about, this really us versus them hostility, hating or not trusting the other side, which is related to but distinct from ideological polarization, which as Anita speaks to is something that, you know, we sort of want to have in a healthy democracy. We want to have constructive disagreements over policy or over the directions that our country are going but we don't necessarily want to be demonizing the other side or unable to work with people across the political aisle from us. It's sort of an important distinction here. Um, and just wanna note that this is all based on work with 
Noam Gidron, who's at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and Jim Adams, who's at the University of California, Davis. So this isn't, you know, my work only. This is a collaborative effort. So sort of the motivation for why we care about effective polarization is, you know, this is something that we see increasing around the world, hostility towards the other side in politics. Obviously, it's, you know, quite high in the United States, also quite high in a range of, of Western European countries. As I'll get to, it's fairly, you know, high in Canada as well. People dislike the other side politically and are increasingly unwilling to work for them. This matters because it's linked to um, increasing willingness to break democratic norms, to support political violence, to not accept losing elections, things like this, which, you know, we really need to have support for these democratic institutions and these norms of constructive disagreement for democratic society to work. Um, right, so turning to some empirics here, right, this is based on election studies that have been carried out from 1996 to 2020 in a bunch of different countries. If you all just look at the right frame here, right, I wanna to focus today on out party dislike that's hating the other side. Um, I think, you know, some, so this is on a zero to 10 scale. How much do you like the other side? But we flipped it. So 10 is hating the other side and, you know, zero is you, you quite like the other side. Um, and this is an average of all the voters in a political system. How do you feel about the other side? And there's this feeling sometimes that Canada has a comparatively sort of warm politics that people don't really hate the other side. But actually, you can see that, well, countries that you might expect, like Greece, Spain, and the United States are the most polarized, you know, hate the other side the most. Canada ranks above average on the countries we have, you know, Canada dislikes the other side more than average. And it's in line with a bunch of countries like the United Kingdom, Portugal, also Austria and Australia that, you know, have relatively polarized politics. So it's not as if this isn't a problem in Canada. And it's also, you know, as Anita's noted, it, it appears to be something that is, is increasing in Canada in recent years. So Canada is not a particularly sort of unpolarized country. Um, and since we're talking about electoral reform today, right, in our book, one of the things we looked at was how related is hating the other side to what's known as the district magnitude, basically to how many um, seats there are in an electoral constituency. So the more, the higher the district magnitude, the more proportional the electoral system. Uh, I'm not going to go through like the technical details here, but we log the district magnitude mathematically. It's just sort of, um, you know, we think that maybe the effect of going from like 100 seats to 150 seats is less important than going from two seats to three seats or, or something like that. But the important thing here is there's a pretty strong negative correlation between how much, you know, how big districts are and how much you hate the other side. So this, you know, this seems pretty important. It seems like maybe there's a relationship between more proportional electoral systems and not, you know, disliking the other side so much, maybe being able to work for, with them. And so, you know, we thought this was sort of an interesting finding worth digging in to more. And so we started thinking about what role might coalition governance play here, right? And so this goes back to what Tim was talking about. We want electoral systems where there's an incentive for both sides to work together, to compromise, to cooperate, even if they don't disagree on every single policy issue, to not, you know, burn bridges. And so in PR systems, we often see these really dense networks of coalition histories or if you look in Germany, right, in recent years, if you look at the Social Democratic Party, right, they've been in coalition with the Greens, they've been in coalition with the Christian Democrats, they've been in coalition with the sort of center-right liberals. And if you look at, you know, the Dutch political system, it's pretty similar. And so in these systems, parties have to sort of play nice and not burn bridges, even if you're not currently in coalition with a party, right? At some point in the future, you might need to form a coalition government with them. So you don't want to be saying particularly nasty things about them or trying to get your supporters to, uh, to really hate them. And so in the paper that Anita referenced that we just published in Comparative Political Studies, uh, 
we, you know, again, I'm happy to talk about like what specifically we did to test this, um, but I don't want to bore you with a bunch of talks about, you know, statistics and different statistical models. Um, but basically, we look at the long term impact of coalitions and we find that partisans continually warm, warmly evaluate parties other than their own who have been in coalition with the preferred party, even taking into account the ideological positions of both parties, and that these effects diminish over time, as you might expect, but appear to last for as long as 15 years. So even you know, two electoral cycles after having not been in coalition governance, voters still remember that these parties work together at some point and you know, view them more warmly than you would otherwise expect. So it seems like, right, coalition governments can really cool the political temperature in a country and allow for this sort of constructive policy-based governance that's less emotional, right? Parties are incentivized to play nicely with each other. Um, and, you know, we're not as, as sort of political scientists, right? We're not necessarily in the electoral reform movement. So I'm not calling like for a specific electoral reform like some of the other folks on the panel. But I want to note that our research su suggests that electoral systems that allow for coalition government are probably going to help lower the temperature and that first past the post systems with single member districts are uniquely unlikely to allow for this type of governance. So, you know, even if I'm not sort of an expert on precisely what the solution should be, you know, can sort of help diagnose the problem here that first past the post systems are particularly sort of difficult to build this sort of less heated political uh, competition that we want. And I'll, uh, I'll leave it there and look forward to uh, all the questions later. Thank you very much, Will. That was excellent. Um, something I picked up listening to Will that I hadn't before is that he was saying that basically the more proportional the system, the better. The more members elected per district um, improves things. So that's something for us to keep in mind. Um, specifically, you know, there have been a lot of commentary in the uh, media from opponents about Italy, and most people don't realize that Italy's system is really not very proportional. Um, a large percentage of those seats are elected by first past the post, and that's what caused their result. So it's something for us to keep in mind when we're looking at what uh, a good electoral system is. Um, the other thing that I noted from what Will said is just the whole idea that uh, as things get more polarized, people get more willing to engage in violence and that kind of thing. And when I started in this job 10 years ago, I remember seeing research that shows civil wars are actually less likely in countries with proportional systems. And I didn't actually put that up anywhere on our website because I thought people are going to think I'm crazy, basically. I mean, what does this have to do with Canada, right? Um, now things have changed so much in the world that really that whole idea of, you know, including people in the system is so much better than excluding them is becoming more mainstream and obvious. Okay, so I wanted to invite on now Matthew Lockwood. Hello, Matthew. Hi, okay. Anita. Hi. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, everybody, for your patience with me as I navigate five guests. It's the first for fair vote. Um, so Matthew is a senior lecturer in energy and climate policy at the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex and co-director of the Sussex Energy Group. He has a master. Oh, is this a master in philosophy and economics? Did I get it? Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a master's in economics, basically, yeah. <laughs> you can tell I don't have one of those. Okay. And from the University of Oxford. So prior to joining Sussex in December 2018, he was the energy policy, in the energy policy group at the University of Exeter and as a senior research fellow working in innovation and governance in the UK energy system. Before that, he was the head of climate change team at the Institute of Development Studies Brighton. His main research interests are in the political economy of climate and energy policy, with particular focus on the UK in a comparative context. He teaches on energy and climate policy and on the politics and governance of energy transitions. Uh, between 1996 and 2011, he worked in a variety of senior policy roles in the third sector and in the UK national and London government. 
His recent his research in recent years includes, among other things, the political sustainability of the UK Climate Change Act, UK climate governance, contrasting approaches to credible commitment to climate policy across countries with different electoral systems and right-wing populism and climate skepticism. So the reason Matthew came to my attention is we saw an article that he uh, written about, oh, I don't know, four or five months ago now, probably. And it's called, How do right-wing populist parties influence climate and renewable energy policies, evidence from OECD countries? And the results of that research were quite interesting in terms of the effect that electoral systems have on the stability of policy on climate. And so I've invited Matthew to talk about his research. Thanks very much indeed, Anita, and thanks for the invitation. Um, it's you know hi from Great Britain, where our politics is crazy at the moment. But um, so I'm going to talk um, a, a little bit about kind of relationships between um, political polarization and, and, in particular, kind of right wing populism, uh, climate policy, and also electoral systems, as Anita Anita said. So I've had a a long-standing interest in um, in populism and, and the relationship with climate change and climate policy, probably going back, you know, 20, 15 years now or so, partly driven by the rise of the, the UK Independence Party in the UK and this sort of sudden surge in the UK of <clears throat> really a kind of right-wing populist party. Um, and so I got, got into this and started looking at it, and there's now... You know, this is a field in academic research which has kind of exploded in the last four or five years and there's now quite a lot of evidence and lots of academic studies um, showing that right-wing populist parties and supporters of those parties are more like are more prone to be climate skeptics or climate deniers if you like and hostile to climate policy um, and this evidence is like from surveys and also from manifesto studies and things like that and it and it's across you know multiple countries um and a lot of this research suggests that the hostility is to do with this kind of the effect of polarization that, that people have been talking about. Um, the way I see it, or the way I framed it, is that uh, a lot of right-wing populists have kind of anti-cosmopolitan worldviews. They see climate change as a preoccupation of, of social liberals, sometimes of international organizations like the UN or in, in Europe, like the EU. And so they oppose it almost by association. You know, we don't like these people over here they seem to have a thing about climate change. So we're gonna be kind of against climate change or against climate policy. Um, and there's a kind of paradox actually in this and that populism, the academic study of populism says that populism is a kind of reactive thing, a reactive phenomenon. So it focuses on trends and on, on crises or at least perceived crises. Um, and so paradoxically, the more importance the climate change agenda has, has gained, the more attention it's received from, the more sort of negative attention it's received from populists. So in Europe, a lot, a lot of right-wing populism a few years ago was much more concerned about migration, immigration, asylum seekers, and so on. And now it's turning increasingly to the climate agenda. So I'm gonna just briefly talk about this recent research that Anita referred to. And it, it asks the question, OK, so we know, you know, populists are, are hostile to the climate change agenda. But what happens when they get when parties, right wing populist parties get into power, either in in parliaments in legislatures or in governments? Do they actually have an effect on climate policy itself? And we also looked at renewable energy policy. So we gather some data and the data come. I can go into more detail in the, the Q&A's, but we've got data. Um, of the sort of quality uh, and extent of climate policy um, on about 30 countries uh, in, in Europe, America, New Zealand, around the world, OECD countries, uh, from the late 2000s right through to the end of the 2010s, um, and also some similar data, uh, similar period, and for 25 countries on renewable energy policy. Um, and we, we identified right-wing populist parties, there's a great data set um, set up by some academics, uh, experts in populism. So we looked at this data and what we found was, um, first of all, that there is a, that we found a strong and significant negative impact um, between right-wing populist parties being in the legislature or the executive um, on climate policy in particular. Um, 
so you know it, it 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 says okay when climate when right wing populist parties do get into power they tend to they tend to kind of reverse or retrench uh, climate policy or, or block new pilot climate policy coming in compared to places where they're where they're not in in those positions. But interestingly, when we broke this down uh, across electoral systems, we found that the effect was not present in countries with proportional representation systems. And so what's going on here? Why, you know, why, why should that be? And our interpretation is, and it's, it's also an interpretation you see in more qualitative studies as well, that um, in PR systems, it's easier for small parties, parties right-wing populist parties, you know, the AFD in Germany, uh, uh, you know, UKIP, in, actually UKIP is in the UK, which is not a, a proportional system, but you have them in Sweden, in Norway, Belgium, in the Netherlands and so on, right-wing populist parties all across Europe. Um, because small parties in PR systems can get representation much more easily in PR systems, they tend to get set up, you know, they tend to come into existence um, and have some success. And they very often get, you know, at the moment, 15, 20, 20 percent of the vote. Um, but, you know, where they get into parliaments, um, it sometimes provokes this reaction from other parties that they close ranks and try to form governments without them. Um, you see that in the Netherlands a few years ago. You see that definitely in Germany, for example. Now, obviously, interestingly, Sweden is a recent uh, exception to that rule. Uh, but generally, historically, a lot of other parties have been very unwilling to really form governments with with right, uh, kind of right wing populist, extreme right parties. On so that's you know so even though and very often then the kind of what you get instead is uh green parties uh and left parties trying to form governments and so you maybe you get actually when you get uh right-wing populist parties coming into parliaments you get a kind of counter reaction where you actually get stronger climate policy uh, in a few cases now when right-wing populist parties do get into government in pr systems they're almost always coalition governments as we've just heard um from will and so um they and they usually almost always enter as junior partners they're usually small parties so what happens is that they end up then getting a small number of cabinet seats and portfolios um and basically what we think has happened is that historically um they've tended to focus their you know try to get the portfolios for issues like migration defense maybe home homes uh you know the kind of home fairs or something like that and not so much the environment and there is some data from another source to support this idea if you're looking at um, parties and portfolio seats over the last few years right-wing populist parties have tended not to go for the environment seat now by contrast in first past post cut systems like canada like the us like the uk right-wing populists rarely set up separate parties so the uk is really pretty unusual instead what they try to do is they try to enter the mainstream center-right party uh, we see this very clearly, obviously, in the case of the Republicans in the US, um, maybe uh, in recent years in Australia, arguably maybe Canada under Harper. Um, and where they do this successfully, and then when that party wins elections, then that faction and the, and the leader within those parties basically controls all the portfolios and the whole cabinet. And so that they can basically, you know, they have a much bigger effect on climate policy as a result. Um, and in some countries where there's an element of PR, we also see, you also see that to some extent in countries where actually, you know, the populist, the right populist party is actually getting a bigger share of the vote. And you see that in Poland um, and in Hungary. So, I mean, the bottom line is that right wing populist party representation as a separate party is much more common in PR countries. Um, and this is an argument sometimes made against you know, PR that kind of lets in extremists to parliament. But the effects on climate policy and maybe on other policies uh, are often more muted. In first past post systems, it's rarer to find right wing populists in power because it's a much harder thing to do to enter a, a mainstream party. But where they do gain power, they have a, a much bigger impact. Um, and then finally, just to finish off. We also looked at renewable energy policy, as I said, and interestingly there, we didn't really see strong effects um, from right-wing populist parties, either getting into legislatures or into, uh, into, into governments. 
Um, and it, it appears that, you know, I mean, a lot of right-wing populist parties don't like renewable energy, but some do, and some like certain, some in some cases, they like some kinds of renewables and not others. So the Rassemblement National in, in France, used to be the Front National, hates wind, but quite likes solar. So it's kind of, you know, <laughs> forces for courses, evidently. Um, and they also might like renewables because they they can you know it fits into this uh, narrative of energy national energy self sufficiency sufficiency. Anyway, I'll leave it there um, and uh, happy to take up any questions and discussion points in the in the chat. Thank you so much, Matthew, for that. Um, it, Matthew's re research came at a really important time for us because I'm sure as everybody knows after the last election there was a lot of concern about the rise of the People's Party of Canada um, you know a separate far right sort of populist party and you know fears about what is that going to mean and that kind of thing and you know what Matthew's research is showing is that the the wildest policy swings and the most unrepresentative governments are actually those produced by winner-take-all systems not those produced by um, by parliaments elected by proportional representation, where people are fairly uh, are fairly included, and you know I, I like what he's saying that you know in some cases uh, those parties are excluded from coalition governments, but even when they are included, uh, in order to play at that table, sometimes they have to moderate. Uh, they have to moderate their brand, and they have to moderate. Um, their policies and they don't get everything that they want, which is quite different from a 39% majority government here in Canada, where we could be looking at a massive swing on climate policy in just another couple of years. Okay, so I'm going to invite on Megan. All right, uh, thank you very much, Megan, for joining us. Megan's be uh, becoming our go-to expert on deliberative democracy at Faro Canada. <laughs> So Megan is a PhD student at Simon Fraser University's Department of Political Science. Working in the field of democratic innovations, her research investigates how forms of citizen participation connect into a policy making process. Her current work examines the municipal land use public hearing as a site of participation in government and decision making on housing. Prior to her PhD, she completed a Master of Public Policy at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. She has had writing on democratic innovation and electoral politics published in Policy Options and in the Hill Times. Megan will be speaking on policy and governance options to enhance participation, engagement, and dialogue in our democratic process and the limitations that these innovations face. Thank you for joining us, Megan. Lovely. Thank you so much, Anita. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. This is such a great turnout to see. Um, so mostly I'll be talking about um, some options and tools to address polarization. But first, I want to give an anecdote because I think it's good contextualization. Uh, so I'm I'm 27 and uh, my first federal election was 2015 and I voted for Trudeau at the time. I didn't have a very strong political identity at that age. Um, but he offered the very compelling option of getting rid of Harper, so that, that got my, my vote. But since then, I've moved uh, what some would consider to be pretty far to the left, um, and I wanted to unpack that and try to uh, determine what led to that, because that's my academic brain. Um, and I think the, the biggest reason I can point to is that um, based on all of the evidence and the governance uh, of the last few years, I do feel like the, the center uh, liberal ideology is not capable of addressing uh, the enormous problems that our society faces. So I just offer that as some insight into maybe a lot of uh, why a lot of young people have gone pretty far to the left. I can't speak for the right and what's driving uh, people to the right. Um, but I just wanted to comment that what the center offers is not always normatively desirable for us. Sometimes it is a capitalist colonial system uh, within which a meaningful feeling of citizenship has diminished under decades of neoliberalism and many have lost faith in it and thus drifted away. So that's just how I wanna start out, but I'll shift now into discussing some tools for addressing what we have come to understand to be polarization. The first thing though, um, I did engineering for my undergrad actually, and a lot of people ask me if there's anything I 
uh, learned that I still use in my work as a political scientist? And largely the answer is no, but there is one big thing. And um, that is what I learned in my first year design class. And that is before we start um, determining solutions, we need to really understand what the real problems are and what the problems are that uh, we, we seek to address with our solutions. So I'm gonna be talking mostly about uh, dialogue or if you wanna be fancy, we can call it deliberation. Um, but I wanna run through a couple different problems uh, associated with polarization because there are a lot of things driving it and see uh, what dialogue can solve and, and what it cannot solve because I don't wanna be making claims that are uh, far too large. So one thing driving polarization, I think, political propaganda uh, in media that deliberately seeks to divide people for political gain. Can dialogue help solve that? I don't think so, probably not. Next, a lack of control over political outcomes. Dialogue probably can't solve that either. Maybe in some senses, if it was very institutionalized. So we'll talk about that a bit later. However, a sense of disconnection, a sense of feeling adrift and alienated from centers of political and social activity. I think dialogue actually can help us with this problem that is driving polarization. So let's dig into that. So there are some really simple forms of dialogue that I think we're probably all familiar with at a very local level. We have just community level socializing and participation in activities like sports or volunteering or kids activities. And then we have the actual politically engaged formats of it that can look like knocking on doors, uh, meeting neighbors, hearing about their political concerns, hearing about what they view to be the policy solutions to best go about pursuing uh, uh, solving those problems. And then we also have things like town halls and public meetings that can bring people together, maybe with a politician or a candidate present, or maybe just to discuss as a group openly um, what we uh, seek to achieve politically. There's also options. Um, for larger scale dialogues um, or institutionalized forms of dialogue. This can look like citizens assemblies. Um, I won't harp about this too much. I feel like a lot of people who follow Fair Vote Canada are already pretty familiar, but it is a sort of a government initiated forum um, in which they bring together a whole bunch of citizens randomly selected in order to deliberate about an issue and hand back some recommendations to the government to guide their policy making in theory, that's how it works. There's also the smaller scale version of these, which can be citizens councils uh, uh, at the level of municipalities or even neighborhoods and urban areas. Another interesting thing are citizen dialogues. If you've heard of deliberative polling, um, I'm gonna drop a link in the chat, but for some reason it's not going to everybody, it's just going to host and panelists. So maybe one of my Fair Vote Canada helpers can uh, take that link and share it with everybody in the chat so you can see it. But deliberative polling is pretty cool too. It doesn't have that sort of um, same objective of delivering recommendations to a government, but it is an open um, space for dialogue and uh, there is a facilitation for exchange of ideas between people that might not otherwise be talking to each other. They can be uh, virtual or in person. Um, and this deliberative polling component, uh, basically it measures people's opinions and views at the beginning and the end of the dialogue to test if there's any um, movement on their opinions based on the, the discussions they had with other people. And the, the evidence is pretty interesting. There can be some real, some real shifts in opinions as a result of simple dialogue with people um, from a range of uh, opinions. So if you're still a bit unclear, I wanna say that the theory of change that connects dialogue to a reduction in polarization, I think that it is building a sense of community, building a sense of engagement, and building a connection that's eroded over time between an individual and the sites of political discussion from which they feel alienated. So do these tools achieve what they claim to? I think under certain circumstances they can. Um, for the institutionalized kind of dialogues, we do need good facilitators. Um, they're even testing automated versions of facilitators, which seem to be promising in preliminary attempts. You can read about it in that link I shared. Um, we need good transparency in the process. We need a government um, to openly share the procedures by which they will operate the forum and by which they will incorporate or at least consider the policy recommendations that that forum produces. Otherwise, people will become really rapidly disillusioned uh, with their efforts amounting to no impact. And then to circle back to some limitations. Um, 
we all know that government is perfectly capable of completely ignoring traditional forms of non-electoral political participation, like public discourses, petitions, and marches. So it is possible that innovative forms of participation will be no different, and they can happily ignore uh, whatever these dialogues produce, uh, whether they are institutional or just community level. Sometimes they'll even do them as a PR exercise to say, look how well we're listening to you. But listening is only half of the equation. Doing is the other half, and it's extremely vital. And then to circle back again to what I discussed at the beginning, polarization did not emerge from a vacuum. I think to some degree it emerged in response to frustrations with political actions, not meeting people's needs. And I think to reduce polarization, um, people need belonging and empowerment, both socially and politically, as well as further standard needs to be met for food and shelter and healthcare and childcare and some disposable income too for fun. So I think one major objective we should keep in mind is that we need to seek out strategies to craft a governance system that is more responsive to needs to improve people's material and social circumstances. There's no unanimity in what these needs are exactly. So I think there's another role there for deliberation to help us decide on that agenda for action. But I have a hunch that it starts with restoration of a sense of community across Canada to reduce our feeling of being um, adrift and alone. Thanks. Thank you, Megan. Wow, you covered a lot in about seven minutes there. <laughs> I just wanted to reiterate what Megan is saying, you know, citizens assemblies are wonderful. And if you are new to Fairville Canada, please check out our website, nationalcitizensassembly.ca to uh, find out about why we're advocating for a national citizens assembly on electoral reform. But citizens assemblies, no matter how wonderful, magical, evidence based and inclusive need political leadership um, to let the rest of the country know that they're happening to provide ways for people to feed into that process and to provide the sense of trust that we've lost, that governments will listen uh, when people take their time to participate on these, that governments will listen to what the recommendations are. So thank you so much uh, for that great introduction to dialogue and deliberation, Megan. I'm going to invite on Rachel Coxcoon. Hi, Rachel. Hi. <laughs> so, uh, so Rachel, I, I met Rachel yesterday. You'll all be interested to know. <laughs> uh, and she was um, referred to me through Matthew, who referred to me, uh, somebody named Rebecca Willis, I think, who was a lead researcher for the UK Climate Assembly, who put me in touch with Rachel, who is a super interesting person doing um, politics and research. She's got like one foot in both the, the political and the academic worlds here. So you'll soon see why she is a wonderful guest for this webinar. So Rachel is a team member at Climate Citizens, a project of Lancaster University, which prioritizes embedding deliberative democracy, like citizens assemblies, into climate change policy. She's founder and director of Climate Guide. Previously, she was the director of Climate Emergency Support Program at the Center for Sustainable Development, where she developed a formidable reputation as a leader in local climate strategy and local authority and community response to the climate crisis. And here's the political part. Rachel is an elected member of the Cotswold District Council for the Liberal Democrats, uh, where she leads the council's work tackling the climate crisis as cabinet member for climate change and forward planning. Rachel's interest is in understanding how political identity affects people's attitudes towards both the content of climate change policy and the processes by which climate policy is made. Her PhD is focusing on the attitudes of rural communities in England to climate policy, especially how the views and concerns of people with right wing and nationalist political identities can be better understood and incorporated into climate policy making. Rachel is going to speak about the importance of approaching climate change in ways that help depolarize the political conversation, bring people of different backgrounds and values together. And she's also going to talk about the impact of first past the post voting on democracy and political polarization in the United Kingdom. Quite a, uh, and all in five minutes. Amazing, eh? <laughs> Thanks Great. for jumping in and joining us, Rachel. Thank you. And um, to try and keep myself on track and not waste all your time, I am going to use some slides if that's okay. So I'll try and share a screen if I can find the right one. 
which one will it be? This will be the one, I believe. This one. There we go. So let me know if you can in the chat or by waving at me that you can see that. And I'll get going. Right. Can you all see those slides? Yes, you can. Marvellous. OK, great. So thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm here with two hats on, really. One is as, as a relatively early stage a PhD student at Lancaster University as part of the Climate Citizens Project. And the other one is, as, uh, as Anita just said, I am a politician in my own right, and we're not all dreadful, uh, and I represent the Cotswolds. So for those of you who are not terribly familiar with uh, the UK, it's the most hobbity part of, of England. That's it in the picture that all of the Cotswolds pretty much looks like that. It's about 450 square miles of some of the most beautiful part of, of English countryside, uh, very rural and very conservative in nature. So quite a shock uh, when we managed to take that as the Liberal Democrats in the elections in 2019. Um, so for the first minute or so, I'm just going to talk about my PhD and the research I'm doing there and why I'm really interested in both the process of policy making as well as the content of climate policy in relation to people who are on the right of the political spectrum, particularly those that have the sort of nationalistic view. And by that, I don't necessarily mean nationalism, I think is a word that is so imbued with kind of horrific undertones and overtones, particularly in Europe in the context of the Second World War, that we forget that there are less kind of um, malign forms of nationalism. There are civic nationalisms and more benign and even banal nationalisms out there that are sort of more better described perhaps as just a pride in one's place, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that one then denigrates other places as a result. Um, and so I, I think that that spectrum of nationalism covers from the, the, the unpleasant to the, to the really quite banal or benign. Uh, and I'm looking at all of those issues and how they affect people's uh, thoughts about climate change. Um, so, oh, I can't seem to change slides. So I think there's this phrase that we hear a lot. Um, I can't I think it might have been George Bernard Shaw who first coined it about, and I think it was about the, uh, the UK and the USA originally, effectively saying two countries divided that were divided by a shared language or a common language. And to some degree, my PhD research has been triggered by an interest in the fact that, that I think UK and, and probably in many other places, society is divided by a shared language. We use words uh, that that fit very clearly with the ideology and the sort of worldview that we have if we're maybe on the left of the political spectrum. We chuck words about around justice and around equality and around all sorts of things that, that are kind of instantly meaningful to us and that wave a flag to other people about what we mean, other people who think like us perhaps, if we're on the left, uh, but that can be quite alienating and off-putting to people on the right. And one of the things that triggered my interest in working with Becky and the others uh, in the Climate Citizens team is about looking at these deliberative processes and these participatory um, forms of democracy, such as climate assemblies, and working out whether actually the very nature of how we talk about them is inherently off-putting to people in certain parts of the political spectrum. So when we think we're sort of encouraging and recruiting through stratifying by age and ethnicity and all sorts of other stuff, are we actually capturing, are we capturing a mini public that is genuinely representative of the macro public in an ideological sense? And I'm, I'm struggling at the moment to find any, any evidence that we really are doing that or that anybody really understands that we're doing that. So that's kind of, the, that's the, the thrust of my PhD at the moment. And certainly that's based on the fact that before I was a student, as, uh, as Nita said, I used to work for the Centre for Sustainable Energy, where I ran a lot of work doing uh, community based engagement and consultation and participatory work on energy planning. And it was definitely the case that what I found through that was that language was incredibly important and that you can use certain words that particularly words like justice and fairness that are quite loaded. So that's a really good example to somebody on the left, words like justice and fairness are obviously quite loaded with a sort of moral, social, intang quite intangible issues. Uh, whereas to those on the right, fairness is often about things like playing by the rules uh, and being very cross with politicians who talk about the environment, but then fly to an international conference, for example. Um, and what I find is that people on the right, particularly in rural areas, their concept and their conception of wanting to talk about climate change and climate-based damage is that they need that to be linked to directly to the green environment, directly to biodiversity, directly to rural economies, agricultural incomes, and making sure that that fairness element is incorporating things like ensuring that the agricultural industry can can transition fairly, that farmers will not be left behind, that the countryside will not be damaged, 
um, but they're less keen and less able to conceptualize some of the wider issues around things like intergenerational justice that, that seem to be very common and trip off the tongue when you hold a similar workshop in a, in a dense sort of metropolitan area in an urban area that's a bit, it's a bit more liberal in its political leanings. And that, and that comes through and, you know, the word environment is thrown around a lot and environment to some people can, can be an almost global concept, uh, particularly again on the left, whereas on the right, the environment is our environment. It's very physical, it's very local. It's something we can touch and we can name and it's that hill and Mary's farm and all that sort of thing. And so what I've always been very careful to do in these engagement processes is ensure that we aren't actually alienating people right from the very beginning by speaking in a different language. Uh, and I think we pepper our discourse uh, in academia and on the left uh, with words and phrases and formulations that are instantly alienating to some people on the right. So that's effectively where I'll leave it in terms of the work I'm doing for my PhD. Uh, and then looking at first past the post and the impact that has on politics and on me as a, as a politician in the UK. Um, for those of you, again, most of you are not from the UK and, and from the outside, people get very confused. What is the UK? It's four countries. Is it one country? Is it four? It's, it would take an entire hour to explain it. And this is the best description I've ever found of it. It's a somewhat untidy state uh, and best understood in historical terms. And I think you could add to that that in, through any sensible contemporary lens, the way we structure our country politically doesn't really make any sense. But here's how it currently works. At the local level, at local government level, we have about 350 local authorities uh, across the UK. And this is just showing you England and Wales. And that's what is in a lot of places as a two tier system. So we have one system shown here on this map, uh, a couple of hundred district councils, often called borough councils as well. They are all elected in England under a first past the post system. Uh, and they're up every four years. That's a, that's a standard set thing. And then overlaid on top of them is another layer called the top tier, which are county councils. And many of these are historic. They go back in some cases over a thousand years. The boundaries have barely changed. Um, and you can see from this map and the previous map, how dominant the blue areas are dominated by conservatives. So the, the, the color of the map shows you who leads those councils. So you can see that in terms of land area, the Conservative Party dominates uh, English politics particularly. And in that overlay area, the two tier level that, that overlays our districts that controls things like our highway system and our adult social care system and so on, it's even more extreme. Uh, so 21 of the 24 uh, top tier councils are conservative dominated and yet when we look back at the previous map and you can see the red areas um, what we see is about 30 of the 36 metropolitan boroughs so the effectively the big urban and industrial areas are dominated by labor so we're very polarized in an urban rural way uh, in which is again similar I know to Canada and the USA and this is repeated at a parliamentary level. So again, this is a map of the UK's parliamentary constituencies for our members of parliament, again, showing largely England and Wales. And once again, you can see that dark blue is the conservative dominated parliamentary constituencies with the red being Labour and yellow Liberal Democrats. And there's a couple of green ones on the left, which are a Welsh independence uh, nationalist party. But when you stretch the A by, um, effectively by demographics, by the size of the population, what you can see is that those tiny red areas actually represent a huge proportion of the population. And what this really shows us, these council maps and the parliamentary maps, is that about 90% of the UK's land area is under the control of conservative administrations, uh, delivered largely through, entirely in fact, through a first past the post voting system, which leaves many millions of people electorally homeless. Uh, turnout at elections, at local elections is extremely low, usually between 30 to 40%. It's a bit higher at a parliamentary election, but it still often only hovers at around 60%. And then we can see that what that means is that in terms of a, a, a big systemic problem like climate change is that where the countryside is the source of a lot of the solutions to climate change, the dialogue about climate change is driven by urban areas where, where the largely more left-leaning people are packed into a much smaller area. And this creates a real problem if you aren't really in, ensuring that something like the UK Climate Assembly was genuinely represented of the political, the macro politics of the country. Um, and so effectively, this is the impact. In England, reliance on first past the post has led to this 
particular outcome where we have what's called undeserved supermajorities, whereby collecting up votes in different wards, you can end up with more than 75% of the seats in the council, dominating it entirely on less than half of the vote. And we actually even do have quite a few councils. It reached a peak in 2016, which are one party states where every single seat was held by either Labour and a couple of northern councils or the Conservatives further south. And the, here is another classic outcome. This is the local member of parliament for the Cotswolds, who only weeks before the December 2019 election was voted the worst MP in the country with, at bottom, 650th of a list of 650 based on a whole load of metrics around responsiveness and so on and yet still went on to win with more than 25,000 majority at the next election purely because of that dominance of um, conservative voting in rural areas driven by the first past the post system. Where we can see that change could happen is in Scotland. Scotland as you probably know is a devolved administration and has uh, control over a whole load of sort of um, policy um, arenas but one of the things that changed in 2007 in Scotland was a move from first past the post in all of their local government elections to single transferable vote and you can see this absolutely stark change at that point that from from that point backwards their electoral outcomes are very similar to those in England big industrial areas dominated by Labour and latterly the, the Scottish Nationalist Party uh, big rural areas dominated by the Scottish Conservatives uh, and as soon, pretty much instantly, as STV, uh, STV was introduced, we end up with this uh, effective power sharing that has been in place ever since at local government level. And that leads to, to much better outcomes. And from my point of view, as a local politician, this is hugely important. We've gotten to power incredibly surprisingly the Liberal Democrats taking the Cotswolds was such a shock that it was on the news in Germany. And, it, you know, no one was more shocked than us, if I'm being completely honest. Um, and, but what we know is that it's a race against time. You're, you're trying to, to undo or unpick the work of years before when you didn't get a look in. And then you know that at some point that pendulum will swing the other way and people will take all your hard done work and unpick it again. And my view as an active politician is it would be so much better to be in a power sharing arrangement. I would so much rather have that than be in the position we are now where it feels like a race against time before the others get back in. I really wish that it didn't feel like there were others. And that's where I'll leave it. Well, so many things you said, Rachel, really resonate with us in Canada. I'm sure I can speak for a lot of people watching this webinar. It's a totally different country and the problems we can see are so much the same. We have the same rural urban divide, the same uh, exaggerated landslides where one party wins every seat in an entire province or region and that just exacerbates the divisions further and that race against time I've never heard it said like that but that's a constant feeling that that we have is just the reality that in four or eight years whatever you worked on is probably going to be flushed down the toilet and it doesn't have to be that way if uh, the parties could put their the democracy ahead of their own partisan self-interest, we wouldn't be here. You know, yeah. Anyway, preaching to the converted here. <laughs> but it was it's it's interesting to hear it from another um, another part of the world. And just for anybody that's new, uh, Rachel was talking about Scotland and the and we were originally going to have somebody from Scotland, but then he couldn't make it at the last minute. But Scotland is a place that has transitioned away from first past the post and they have mixed member proportional um, for their um, Scottish level elections and then their local elections, they have single transferable vote, which is the proportional ranked ballot system. And it has made a huge difference in terms of the tone of the debate um, in Scotland, as well as their electoral results. Okay, so we're going to move into Q&A now. So I'd invite all our panelists to turn your webcams and back on so we can see everybody. And the the number of questions is a little bit overwhelming and <laughs> and I was never very good at making decisions so we'll just do what we can here it is what it is. Um, I'm going to ask I'm going to sort of pull together different questions that I'm seeing rather than like like different themes here. So a few people have asked before and during this webinar is it this this polarization and hyper partisanship and all the pro common problems that we've all talked about it's not just Canada is it global and what's driving it what what 
if it's not just Canada, it's global, what's driving this, this hyper partisanship and polarization and division that we're seeing? Anybody want to take a stab at that? I, well, I, can, I can start. I'm um, sure. So it's, it, it is global. Um, and it's, it, it's, has risen. I mean, in, in our work, we find that it's risen, uh, you know, sort of everywhere, but we also do find that there's a big difference between the levels of polarization in first past the post systems versus proportional systems. It does tend to be a lot higher in first past the post systems where you have this us versus them dynamic where it's, you know, a winner take all system where the stakes of elections are just that much higher. So that is driving a good bit of it. But globally, um, we also have some research that finds that when politics is structured around issues of culture and national identity and you know immigration, things like that, polarization tends to be much higher than when it's structured around things like economics, unemployment, inflation. Um, so these seem to be more emotional issues that really drive this sort of effective polarization. And obviously, if you look at recent campaigns in the United States, the UK, to some extent, Canada as well, these issues have really been in the forefront. So that probably also explains at least part of the overall rise. Yeah, I just uh, want to throw in on the back of that. I think that uh, the un part of the answer is deeply unsatisfying, which is these tendencies have always been there. Um, but I think that what's more important is why are they so emergent now, which I think is the root of the question. Um, and so the one thing that I'd like to add to that is that we have un an unfortunate, what I would consider to be as someone who studies the effects of communication and you know, media coverage on people's thought processes, we have an unfortunate convergence of sort of entrenched political systems meeting a new uh, system of monetizing the distribution of information. Right, so you have a an information environment where every click is monetized, where uh, newscasts can't count on you know one, two, three, four million people viewing them every night, start to finish. You've got a system where there's a an incentive to shock, surprise, divide, attract, raise those emotions right away, and unfortunately, I think it's a very toxic mi mixture. You have a an information environment that's supposed to be keeping people informed that is incentivized to excite people. Um, and at the same time, we have deeply sticky, difficult, difficult political issues that we're dealing with right now. Uh, and in a lot of cases, like in Canada, the systems themselves are not well equipped for that kind of deep digging. And when you add those two things together, the magnifying effect is extraordinary. I don't know. <laughs> Should I just quickly add something? I think that um, you know, if you read some of the literature on this, one of the one of the stories about this increase in polarization um, is about changes also in the nature of the, the the kind of economies in which we live. So you know, a lot of the Western world has become extremely globalized over the last twenty five years, and there's been a, a decline of traditional industrial jobs um, and employment. And, it, and going with that also a loss of status, I think, um, in communities and families and, and workers and so on. And we all kind of know this as background, background knowledge. And then you have the kind of rise of what some people call the knowledge economy, which, which uh, places a great deal of uh, value on education. And so some of the big political differences, you certainly see this in, in the UK, some of the big stark differences are about between, you know, university educated basically people and those who have not had any university education or you know leave school at 16 or earlier and that's also partly associated with age as well and a lot of the contrast that Rachel was, show, uh, was showing us between the sort of countryside with small towns in Britain um, and the big cities this is now quite well documented there's a real gradient and a real contrast in age you know young people in the cities it's older people less well-educated people um who are less skilled people who are in the smaller towns in the countryside and actually the links between those towns and the big cities have got weaker over the last 25 30 years so there's kind of been a drifting of the social and the economic worlds um in different parts of the population which 
you know, then lead to these political political uh, uh, kind of polarization. And I think the last thing to say about it is that there's an emphasis in some of the literature also in um, saying that for some of these people who have been left behind by globalization, this is the kind of classic uh, formulation, they haven't, they feel that they haven't had a political voice because mainstream parties, and including social democratic center left parties, have kind of moved to the cities. They moved to the young, educated people. Um, at least that's been the case in the UK, kind of classically, you know. Um, and so that's part. I think that. I mean, I think it can't all be reduced to economics, but I think that there is something important in all of that. Anybody else want to jump in on that? Megan, Rachel. Yeah, I, I don't want to take uh, a lot of time on it, but just to say that I would really recommend a book uh, called Anti-System Politics by Jonathan Hopkins that I read recently, which, you know, really sort of covers some of these issues. And, and it does touch on what Matthew was just saying, because it's essentially that some of this polarization is kind of a misplaced reaction, largely to neoliberal market conditions, you know, effectively where people feel unprotected by and, and abandoned by the system po politics doesn't run the show <laughs> the market runs the show and so there's this huge frustration and in places where you know like we see this in the UK in places where you've got the, the younger people are very left left behind left out they, they seem extremely disadvantaged very very hard to get on the on the housing market very hard to get really good quality jobs and, and obviously nothing like the pensions that people of my parents age would have had you know, that's where you get the, the more of the, some of the left wing swings coming through and that kind of polarization. And it's in some ways I feel, you know, I found that book very helpful in helping me formulate a, more of a clear sense in my head about what is it that people are rejecting or resisting. It's not necessarily other in a way re resisting the other is a, is a symptom of this much bigger market other that is kind of damaging everyone's life. Um, Anyway, I just thought that was a very helpful book and other people might be interested in it. Anybody else want to jump in on that? No? Okay. Um, so I'm going to, there's so many questions here. I'm going to read this one from Anne and Sue Lookout that she sent to me before the webinar because it was kind of interesting. And she was saying that um, the, the Lieutenant Governor Elizabeth Dowdswell gave these messages in her keynote address at the Great Lakes Forum. She said, there's three major threats today, climate change, wars, and health pandemics. And she gave a bunch of lessons for um, approaching these. And those included collaboration, interdependency, growing trust and confidence in science, genuine importance of local government, imperative of engaging civil society, um, and so Anne's question is, given the complexity of our global issues, as well as governments that are polarized and divisive, how are we ever going to solve issues without a collaborative approach? So I guess the flip side of that is how, <laughs> it's a big question, how do we create a more co collaborative approach? What can, we, we can't get proportional representation in Canada, like right now, what could we, all, or in the UK, <laughs> what could we, or in the US, what could we all do to help encourage a more collaborative, collaborative approach between citizens or between politicians? Big question. I guess I can I jump on that uh, just quickly. I think it really connects to a lot of what I was speaking about. Uh, there are multiple channels to pursuing uh, these objectives that we have of bringing more people into politics. Um, proportional representation would be a great one, but it is just one. Um, and I think that in the meantime, uh, restoring uh, community dialogues uh, is a very important part of that. Um, it's an enormous question, so I don't really know how else to go about saying this, um, but I've, uh, I've also popped a, another link in the chat that maybe you guys could share with the wider group, um, because this connects to another uh, question that I saw in the Q&A section, um, but there is a lot that we can do to institutionalize participation and institutionalize uh, deliberation and discussion of communities and connect that more efficiently uh, and effectively into uh, government decision-making systems in order for citizen views to be better incorporated into policy to reduce uh, some of these feelings of complete ineffectiveness and uh, disconnection from political discourses that I think a lot of people feel. <laughs> 
Tim? Yeah, I just I, exactly. <laughs> Uh, there are so many other routes, and I think in Canada, in Ontario, where I live, um, a really overlooked uh, place for the potential to build broader consensus building and mechanisms for consensus building is at the municipal level, because we don't have partisan presence. Uh, well, that's not entirely accurate. They're present, but there's no official partisan involvement in our municipal elections. And so the dynamics of getting elected, remaining elected, uh, dealing with citizens tend to be far more uh, tied to policy points, class identification, those sorts of things than it is to straight up uh, partisan identifications. And because so few people vote in our damn municipal elections, there's a huge amount of um, potential there for organizations genuinely interested in dialogue to engage with those municipal bodies to drive things like, for example, participatory budgeting. Um, that if there's enough noise, there's enough push, enough conversation, an effort to run uh, candidates who are committed to these sorts of ideals, you can start building that kind of expectation at a local level, which can only have knock-on effects to the, the more senior levels of government. So I think the, the municipal level is a, a largely untapped uh, area of possibility for growing a more participatory and consensus uh, built politics, particularly in Canada, not in BC, obviously, but in Canada, generally. Anyone else? On the question of how we can foster a more collaborative, cooperative political environment? Because others oh, are like, go I got to jump back in with one more thing. I, I would love us to normalize the running of independence. Um, I think that we have stood back too much and paid too much attention to the entrenched partisan interests. Political parties have no official standing in our system of government. They are a convenience club um, for folks. They are a simple way of aggregating interests. They're a traditional way. So, I mean, I, we don't want to spit entirely in the face of tradition, but I think that it's, it's lovely on a local level when someone with strong views chooses to, to throw themselves at this wall and run publicly to try and drive conversation out of those partisan boxes. And I think that, uh, that we should probably be making more use of that, particularly these days. I just wanted to comment to the whole idea about encouraging citizens assemblies in general. So just like really small little story here since Fairboat Canada has been championing our national citizens assembly and electoral reform that I hope we get one day. Um, you know, I've been learning a lot more about citizens assemblies around the world and particularly the climate assembly in France which was both a success and a failure at the same time. Uh, the success was that the president Emmanuel Macron made a point to make sure that everybody in France knew about this assembly, which is just weird. Usually they're kind of shuffled off in a corner and, you know, like there's this like a quiet advisory group and nobody knows about them, which sort of defeats the purpose. But in France, uh, he overcommitted and said he was going to basically write, almost write everything they said into law. And so at the end, of course, they had all these amazing and somewhat radical proposals for the environment. And then the lobbyists came in and then he said, well, I didn't really need that. And, uh, you know, then you had a lot of angry people. The positive side of that was because the citizens of France were invested in this citizens assembly. They knew what it was. They knew it was people just like me. They knew what the recommendations were. It create it's, you know, helped uh, create a, a positive push for change that wouldn't have happened if he hadn't have uh, hadn't have publicized that. Now, how is that filtering to this local level in Paris? They have just started permanent citizens assembly for the city of Paris. So there will be 100 randomly selected citizens that will rotate on, I think it's a yearly basis, to decide what issues they want to study. They choose the issues. They then delegate it to a citizen's jury, which is a small version of a citizen's assembly, to write legislation, which then goes directly to Paris City Council. So it is possible to include people and change the culture of politics, even when it's not quite there yet at the, at the national level it's uh changing the culture from the bottom up is and pushing from the top down okay i have wanted to have one more one more question that's just before we have to say goodbye which is more in our typical sort of questions that we get somebody is saying um 
not all coalitions are between parties on the left, right, or center. Um, is okay. Basically, what they're saying is historically, when we saw coalition governments, they tended to be the left wing parties banding together or the right wing parties banding together. Is it better for polarization to have the kind of grand coalitions that cross party lines, such as the ones that we've seen in Germany and we're starting to see a little bit in some of the European countries? Is that better for polarization? Is that worse? Who has a comment or reflection on that? Turn your mic on. Will. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I suppose I talked about coalition, so I should I should try and answer this question. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, so grand coalitions are naturally going to involve compromise between two parties that are on opposite sides of the electoral system. The leaders of these parties will be less incentivized to snipe at each other, right? I mean, you, you didn't see a lot of sort of intra-coalition hostility between the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats in Germany when they were a grand coalition together. And so, you know, to the to the extent that we think, um, you know, moderate policy is, is a good thing, uh, you know, yes, these grand coalitions can be very useful. We saw some interesting stuff on, on climate change in Germany with the Green Party being actually in coalition with the center right. And, you know, Germany has developed sort of a reputation of being quite progressive on the climate, even though it was governed by the right for, you know, most of the last, um, almost the last 20 years, actually. So to some extent, you know, this this can be beneficial because it, it gets rid of the, you know, sniping between the center left and the center right. Um, but, you know, I don't think there's any, I think, you know, the sort of the, the story that we're telling in our research anyways, is it's more about the fact that in proportional systems, you don't know who your coalition partners are going to be 10 years in the future. And so even the parties that you're not currently in coalition with, you know, you're incentivized to be, unless it's some party that, you know, you probably won't see the social Democrats playing nice with the radical right or something like this, right? You know, there are exceptions here, but for the most part, uh, mainstream parties are incentivized to play nicer with each other in proportional systems, even if they're not currently in coalition. So I think that's a big part of the story too. So it doesn't have to be these grand coalitions, but it is, you know, I think it is nice that there's the opportunity in these systems for the center right and the left or, you know, the liberals and the greens or whomever to get together and be in coalition because it incentivizes them to play together more nicely. Anybody else? Okay. Well, that um, was a well, yeah. I was oh, go ahead, say, Matthew. Maybe I might put a, a, a different view, which is that um, you know, on the other hand, so Germany's had this grand coalition for a long time, but it's also had the AFD um coming out and coming through. And I think that in a way. You can see the the AFD on the on the, you know, and some actually, you know, the trouble with these terms left and right is that they're not entirely accurate. So, you know, left and right populists often sometimes share some, you know, they both believe in intervention by the state in markets, for example. But anyway, you know, AFD may be seen as a reaction against the grand coalition. And it's I, I come back to this point of I made at the end of my last comment, which is about if there's a group of people in a society who feel they're not politically represented. Um, then that causes problems for everyone potentially, and then they find voice through these these radical parties. Um, and the question is, well, what do you do about that? And I guess there's two view. You know, one view is to try to kind of just keep them contained through you know through institutions. Um, another is to have dialogue. Um, and I, you know, but I guess so. I think that the, the the dialogue thing has to be there because in the end, you know these are people they're in society they're not going to go away and and some of their concerns are actually some some of the concerns get very twisted and so on but some of them are actually legitimate um you know so i think that um i think that grand coalitions you know on the face of it might might be a good idea but there's a danger as well i guess that i'm saying that if it increases the sense of being like well it, you know everyone else gets included apart from us then that that can make things worse um, and I think that Germany might be a case in point because the AFD seem to have grown and they seem to have become more radical. So, Will, <laughs> one more minute. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just, I, I, I agree with a lot of with a lot of what Matthew said, but I do want to just sort of 
flag that the counterfactual might be something like right in the United States where there was a large center left party, a large center right party, and the extreme group ends up taking over, uh, you know, the mainstream party. That's often the counterfactual uh, in, you know, when you're comparing a proportional system where you do give some representation to the AFD, but the AFD actually has remained, you know, a, a fairly small and, you know, regional party within the uh, the German system. And, you know, they've they've gained in, in, in vote share, but they're not close to be anything being like the largest party on the right or something like this. Versus if, if you look at the U, U, US or now, you know, potentially at, at the UK, you can get these sort of populist centrists. So I just wanted to flag that that's a difference between what happens in the PR versus first past the post systems. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm not arguing again, you know, I'm not arguing in favor of first past the post winner takes all systems, I think, in this context. It's just this more general point that, um, you know, uh, if if these groups feel they don't have a voice, they're going to try to find a way in one way or another, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think we can all agree on that on this panel. And one of the interesting things for me over the last, um, you know, five, 10 years is how Europe has changed in its approach to how they deal with some of these smaller right parties. At first, it was like, we're going to put a, you know, a boundary around them and nobody's going to work with them and they're pariahs and that's it. Right. And over time, approaches have evolved and there's not a right and wrong way. It's sometimes they can become junior partners and they can moderate. Sometimes they're the what they're saying and how people feel is they're still being excluded. It just it's really, really complicated. But all we do know is exactly what Matthew and Will have been saying. When you shut people out, um, good things don't happen. They can they can cap in first past the post or winner they will capture a larger party they will occupy your capital city for a month you know or people will get even angrier and that'll just that that exclusion we're not going to let you in any way shape or form you're bad just does not work it's counterproductive and so we need to have more sophisticated ways of dealing with with democracy and bringing people together and eight ways to have that dialogue so i really appreciate everybody joining me today it's uh we're two minutes past our time it's been 90 minutes this is uh, a long time for people and as i listened to each one of you i felt like we could have a separate webinar with each guest on here because we really just only um, skimmed the surface on this so i'd like to thank everybody uh which was you know over 350 people at one point here and most of them have stayed with us uh, for joining us today for this important discussion. We hope to have a lot more of this. If you want to get involved with Fair Vote Canada, if you're not, you should, you probably are on our mailing list if you're on this webinar, but if you'd like to get more involved, you can go to our website, uh, fill out the Get Involved form. You can support us financially uh, by the donate button, and you can send me all your thoughts and ideas afterward for how we should have the next step in this conversation uh, to encourage more collaborative politics and proportional representation at every level in Canada. So thank you very much.